Welcome to Some Things Considered, the podcast where we are obsessed with story. We celebrate creativity and we talk to cool people to find out what makes them tick. I'm your host, Sean Murphy. I'm an author. I direct the Center for Story at Shenandoah University and I run the nonprofit 1455 Lit Arts. For more about me and what I do, check out seanmurphy.net. Hey, everybody, welcome back to Some Things Considered. This is the podcast where we are obsessed uh, with story. We celebrate creativity and talk to cool people to find out what makes them tick. I'm your host, Sean Murphy. I'm an author. I direct the Story Center at Shenandoah University, and I run the nonprofit 1455 Lit Arts. For more about me, check out seanmurphy.net. Um, but the the best part of all the things I do is I gives me the opportunity to to chat with amazingly talented people. I've befriended many of them, and it's absolutely the greatest joy of, of all of this kind of creative artistic stuff. And I am so excited to welcome back, because this is not our first rodeo, my friend and, and hero, Whitney Collins. She is the author of the brand new Ricky and Other Love Stories, as well as Big Bad, which we talked about a few years ago when it came out. Both of these are from Sarah Band Books, amazing, uh, amazing um, publisher. Uh, Big Bad won the 2019 Mary McCarthy Prize in short fiction and the 2021 Bronze Medal Indies Award for short stories and the 2022 Gold Medal Ippy Award for short story fiction. So if this is your first time encountering Whitney, you now you know she's the real deal and she's got the accolades to prove it. Um, her stories have won multiple awards. It would take too long to list them all. Uh, she's appeared in all the best lit mags, including Agni, Gulf Coast, American Short Fiction, etc. She earned her MFA from the Naslin Mann Graduate School of Writing, and she is an awesome literary citizen and a, a friend I'm happy to talk to. Whitney, welcome. And first and foremost, yay, congrats uh, this week, you. hot off the presses. Yes. Um, so Ricky much. and Love Stories dropped this week. It did. And um, I'm just so excited to be here and be back. It's It was like almost exactly three years ago that we talked about Big Bad. It doesn't seem like three years, but this is it, we're it, still in COVID time, kind of. We it doesn't. <laughs> it, it Time flies. But one of the things that I, I, I would love to kick off just saying and noting, um, you know, all of us try to be busy and productive. I think the world has only gotten more chaotic and crazy. So so a very hearty extra congrats and and approbation for being productive. I mean, to have another book come out relatively shortly after, you've been a busy bee. Um, talk yeah. about what's been going on and how this collection came together. Well, so there is a little bit of overlap between when I was working on Big Bad and working on Ricky. Um, so it wasn't like I wrote wrote this and got it published in three years. I think I wrote um, Big Bad mostly between 2016 and 2018, pretty much. And then right after I kind of had the manuscript of Big Bad, 2018, I started writing some new stories. And um, everyone kept saying, well, now you got to write a novel. You got to write a novel, novel, novel. So the stories, I just kept pushing to the side. And then I'd say, now nah, I got to write on my novel. And then I'd start something. And then I'd go, ooh, I have a story idea. And I'd so I, I just kept writing stories. And finally, I said, you know what, maybe I should just wait on the novel and write another collection because these are piling up over here. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, they all kind of feel like they have something in common. And that's when the whole love stories umbrella idea kind of came into play. I thought these are all about relationships, all different sorts of relationships, um, you know, marriages, dating mother son parent child friendships so i thought they really are all about love so i just started calling them the love stories and one after another started come once i gave them kind of permission they, that that was all it took then they started really coming and then ricky which is the you know the title story yeah. that was the one that won <clears throat> the shorter fiction award through american short fiction and i thought you know what we're just going to call this we're gonna we're gonna honor Ricky and let him have the the title and so anyway that's 
they I started writing 2018 and then they got accepted through Saraband 2023, 22. So it was like yeah. a four or five year process. Okay. So that was one of the questions I was going to ask later, but let's just dive into that because that's the obligatory, even cliched, is there a novel? What is it yeah. about short fiction? But you just answered it brilliantly. But talk yeah. a little bit about, um, you know, what is it about? Because as, as you and I both know from personal yeah. experience, there are plenty of novelists that either can't write short fiction, don't yeah. want to write short fiction or write it really badly. Um yeah. What is it about the form uh, for someone that hasn't read this book yet? Because the, the the stories answer their own questions. But what is it about the short form, especially the very short form, which many yeah. of these stories are very bite-sized? What is it yeah. about that that speaks to your kind of artistic sensibility? Well, I really love the idea of like the resource, the resourcefulness of a short story where, you know, one of my favorite teachers in grad school said, you know, give your writing a box, put, give it some parameters or else you just, you know, you don't, you don't have any boundaries. It would be like playing soccer, but there's no soccer field, yeah. you know? So I was like, oh, that's a great idea. So she said, you know, it's always nice when a contest or a literary magazine says we we're looking for stories under 2000 words. Yeah. And there is something very instructive about that. And then you were forced to have your beginning, middle and end, your conflict and resolution, you know, within this tidy framework. And so there's something I love about that. I think it's, there's a discipline behind the madness with a short story and with a novel, it's very, very daunting for me who enjoys that structure. So I'm actually currently working on a novel and I have created a very strict structure that it has to <laughs> I, I'm tr I'm tricking my brain into writing it, basically. Yeah, I mean, having written a couple of novels, not to mention horrible unpublished ones that I, I can't even say I've written, but well, I've, I've described it. Myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've described it for lack of a more pretentious way of putting it is when I have written novels, I find myself thinking novelistically. And if someone were to say, understandably, what does that mean? Right. I tend to be thinking in dialogue and I'm thinking in scenes. Certainly when I'm thinking poetically, it's a whole different mechanism that that seems to be going for lightning in a bottle. And then short story, it's not that it's in the middle, but like you just put it perfectly. I love the idea of kind of a box. So before you go into it, because a poem could be long, a novel could right. be long or short or episodic, but a short story, there are like, it's like a spreadsheet, like going into it, there are boundaries. Boundaries. And, and everything yeah. is compressed and so you're getting maximum feeling i think where right. where you maybe lack dialogue in the, the long description the onus is on the writer to waste no space and i don't think a lot of people can pull that right. off right well it's you know you either you either love it or hate it i think as a writer i think you either settle into it with this like oh thank goodness i only have to produce this amount of words. Whereas uh, people that are drawn to writing, I mean, novelists, you know, that could feel really confining for them. So, you know, there's, but I, I really appreciate it. I think it helps me as a writer. I also like the idea of our current attention span lending itself to the short story or to the episode versus the, you know, gone with the wind and the, you know, you know, Dr. Zhivago, it's like, do we have that? Do we have that attention span anymore? And there's something sad about that, but also something exciting about let's make it happen quickly. So, I mean, we're definitely channeling the same brain because I've thought, <laughs> I've thought quite a bit about how I would say less than 10 years ago, I was actually reading, and I know these stories are always written, but I was reading a lot of stuff like, is short stories done? Like, right. Is, is this form just... And it's really, and I think, of course, it's a combination of social media, Twitter, attention span bandwidth. But as a short fellow short story writer, um, yeah. let's celebrate the fact that for a variety of reasons, some of them culturally, you know, uh, less savory, but also right. just we're leaning into um, where the mind space is. And hell yeah, you know, if, if short stories right. are about to have a moment, what a great time for us to be uh, plowing those fields. Uh, that's how I feel. And I, and 
you know, it's okay to embrace shifts in how we process stuff. It doesn't mean that it'll be forever. I mean, it's th things may feel less chaotic 10 years from now. And we might say, uh, you know, we may become a culture that embraces, you know, you know, taking your time and long Sunday drives. And, you know, the, the philosophy of leisure may return to an extent to where suddenly that becomes, I don't want to say fashionable again, but, you know, there always are shifts. And right now the shift seems to be, I would love to experience literature, but I need it in a way that I can digest it. Yeah. And um, so I'm a big fan of the short story. Plus, I just think short stories in general, um, because it has to happen quickly, they tend to be creepier, more compelling, more, um, they're just zingers, which I love. Yeah, and, and I think it also in an interesting way, the, the rules, it's, we just talked about how there's stricture and rules, and yet you almost, and you do this so deftly, kind of throw the rules out the window. And there's this, it, with your work, Whitney, there's an incredible intelligence and sensitivity, but there's a definite playfulness, but it comes from a place that is not, in my opinion, my strong opinion, it's not the least bit self-indulgent. It's actually to add the spice as opposed to feeling constrained by, am I going to lose people here? It's, there's a deep respect for the reader uh, that I think you bring to bear. And I do think while I would recommend this book to any uh, Gen Zer or anyone in my parents' generation, there is something about the sensibility here, which we can talk about. I mean, just look at the cover. There is something about the sensibility I, I felt very spoken to as a Gen <laughs> Xer. Um, and again, not in a remotely um, uh, patronizing way or or purposeful. It just obviously comes out of the person writing it, which gets yeah. into the whole write about what you know, but also let your imagination run wild. And that's one of the other things I definitely want to get your thoughts about. There, you're one of those writers where, when I read a certain story, I'm like, I need to like, where the f did that come from? But in the best <laughs> possible way. Yep. Uh, well, I ask myself the very same question, John. <laughs> I look in the mirror and I go, well, where did that come from? And Honestly, sometimes it'll be with just one idea. Like I'll, I'll see, I'm trying to, th I'm trying to even think like, so there was the story where the boys working and it's called uh, Dawn and it's about the, the young cashier that works at the, it's called, there's a box for that. It's basically a play on the eighties container store. He yes. works in a store that just sells boxes from size cough drop to coffin is their tagline. <laughs> and I, that is a great, great example of a story where I thought, oh yeah, let me write a story about a kid that works in the container store and he's super bored and some weird girl comes in just with like a seed. And I was like, okay, we're going to see where this goes. And so sometimes it's just a one sentence idea and then the weirdness just it's like it just starts seeping in it's like i kind of peek under something and here comes the flood so a lot of it is very hard to explain a lot of it's just this magical weird mystical occurrence sometimes with a short story yeah and and, and what i what i what i really celebrate about this book so much cuz again to be self to be self indulgent and and selfish very inspiring for me someone who's written for better or worse for a long time, it's always welcome to be reminded, like, trust the process. Um, yeah. Don't pre-write so much. Don't try to telegraph. And just to be in awe of the subconscious and, and be yeah. able to be able to yeah. say what you just said so authentically and without any pretense, I don't know where it came from. It's like, well, it yeah. comes from in there, but then what is in there? Is it everything we've seen and heard? other yeah. people we've read, dreams we've had. To me, that gets into that element of play and awe of the process itself. And I think you exemplify yeah. like this really beautiful balance of technical proficiency, but a, a, a genuine trust in you know, follow the subconscious or- And I, you know, I did that a lot more in this collection than I did in Big Bad. Big Bad is 13 stories and almost all of those stories are 10 to 15 pages and they follow, they're really weird stories, 
but yet they follow a very traditional um, story arc. Yep. And I just started playing a little bit in this one with length of story. And does it have to have a plot that is resolved all the time? How much tension can our reader handle? Yes. And I really wanted to put a lot more on the reader in terms of like, if I push myself as a writer, I'm going to push you as a reader. And then how, hap how, how happy can we be? Happy is not the right word, but how much can satisfied can we be with ambiguity yep. and, and things that are unresolved? Because let's face it, the reason we like things to be resolved in a story is because nothing is ever resolved in life. That's right. That's so right. these stories push a little bit back on the idea that everything has to be tied up and it's more like how much of real life can you handle in a on the page which is there's more ambiguity and it's it's uncomfortable yes and you know i think i think you just made me think of something whitney like i think there's such a there's such a difference between when an artist is not at the height of their powers and is is relying on the reader kind of through assumed cliche yeah. What you're doing is a very generous kind of collaboration. Like, what are you bringing to the story? And I think, oh, I don't yeah. want to say, you know, fine line, because that's a cliche, but there is a fine line between, I don't know what it means, and saying, right. you might color this with your own, like, we're all women, or we're all men, or we're all teenagers right. once. That enlarges the story. And I think that's another kind of magic ingredient that you've tapped into, which is a shorter story can resonate and echo after it's been read. And that's a real gift that you give to um, the reader. Well, thank you. But I, yes. And I, but I also agree that this is the most, my most favorite thing about the short story form. I mean, if you go back to, you know, older previous short story, American short story writers, you know, Flannery and Raymond Carver, and uh, just, this is what they're known for, not them in particular, but the, the yeah. American short story in particular is known for not being comfortable. It's an uncomfortable experience, but it's delightful at the same time. And it does demand participation with the reader because, you know, I don't specifically know exactly why that is, but, you know, I, nothing is more fun than sitting in a workshop and listening to people tell you what your story means and you can't say anything. Because then you go, oh my gosh, no, that's not what I was thinking, but that's what I want it to mean because that person made me see words that I put on the page completely differently. So there's a lot of room for interpretation in short stories. I think novels spell it out because they're longer. Yep. Yep. And, and I also think we're in an era for a variety of reasons um, where writers are, are wearing their nobility on their aesthetic sleeves and the more <laughs> sensitive and the less complicated things are. It's like, you understand I'm one of the good guys, right? And it's right. so pandering, <laughs> right. it's so unsatisfying. Um, and I think it, it's also an insult to an intelligent reader um, to, to not trust that they're either gonna get it, whatever it is, or that they won't be able to bring more, um, more to the page. I wanna read um, one of the blurbs, because I think for anyone that's, I mean, who out there right now is like, all right, I'm in. But if you're not, here's a little more. Um, the book has been described very accurately, in my opinion, as, quote, blending elements of Southern Gothic, speculative fiction, and horror. Uh, it is political and personal, bitter and sweet, ultimately a lot like love. And Karen Tucker raves, it's the kind of wickedly funny book that whenever you throw your head back to laugh, drops a fierce capsule of truth into the pink of your throat. What a wonderful uh, description. And I think that's totally spot on. I'll just add myself, Whitney, my favorite kind of writers ultimately are in love with people. Um, so many writers today, in my opinion, are in love with words or ideas or worst of all, themselves. So when a right. writer is obviously in love with people, they are therefore obsessed with understanding people and the inexplicable things we do. And I think you are a master of getting inside that wonderful, occasionally unsettling space. Well, I'm, thank you, but I, I, I agree. I mean, I do, I mean, I, I say all the time, like the, my first love before, when I was a little kid, I just was like, 
madly in love with the world. And I still think I am. And people, it's, it's a horrible, cruel, um, beautiful, fascinating. I mean, you want to just talk about like juxtaposition. It's just walk outside and think about everything that is simultaneously occurring on this planet right now. And it's just, I, I think I've always thought that way. Like, I'm constantly thinking of like how many things are going on at once. And if you can get comfortable with that idea, even though it's extremely overwhelming, yeah. it is outrageous just to consider what all the different things that are happening at once on this planet. And it's just, I'm madly in love with that idea. It's just, and I think, okay, so I'm also crazy about people. I, I will be standing in line somewhere and I will be watching horrible human behavior and I will have to control myself from judgment. Well, I probably still judge, but I will think, nope, nope, it's material. So every time I feel myself on the verge of just like <laughs> hating the world, which is very easy to do if you spend a lot of time in an airport or the DMV or whatever. <laughs> Or, you know, just, I think there's so much vitriol out there now against everybody's, there's a lot of emotion out there. But if you can just rein it in and use it as an opportunity to, if you're an artist, it is material. It is material. And just to go, wow, look at the gem that just arrived in front of me in the form of this very difficult human. Um. So I I do I'm fascinated with people and I think if you I think if you can have compassion and realize that most people are behaving in a horrible way because of something that happened to them I'm always interested in writing about the something that happened to them. Yeah, that's yeah. my favorite thing to dig down. But uh, but at the same time I'm not going to make them look good. <laughs> right. Well, I think that is a a very wonderful tee up to. Yeah. If you're willing and able, uh, I we would love to hear you read from this collection of a story of your choosing. Well, thank you. So I'm thinking what I might read from. There's a couple of most stories in this in this collection are an actual story unto themselves, and there are a couple though that are um, kind of little miniature collections of flash fiction. So there's one called Threesome which is three shorter stories that are all very different, I think. And I think that that is, I think that's the one I'll read. Okay. Um, they originally were all submitted separately as their own little flash pieces. And then finally I was like, you know what? I like the idea of putting them together and then calling them threesome because it is a love stories and everybody will go, yeah. oh, that's going to be an exciting one. And it's, it's you know, <laughs> false advertising. Right, right. <laughs> Um, so I'll read this one. Okay. Um, threesome. Mrs. Skelton never cooks. She pours cereal for dinner and sits at the end of the table with her saccharine soda and watches everyone else eat. Frosted flakes and whole milk for Myrna, raisin bran and skim milk for Hugh, Cap'n Crunch dry for Jason, shredded wheat left in brick form with chocolate milk for Annabelle, four boxes and three cartons. Tell me you like it, Mrs. Skelton says, as though she's made a standing rib roast, as though she wears a hairnet for General Mills or Kellogg's or Post, as though she knows the feel of a swollen udder in her manicured hands, a milking stool under her bony buttocks, tug spray, tug spray. Tell me I did good, she begs. At department stores, Mrs. Skelton steals silk scarves because they're the easiest things to steal. They can slip into a tall boot, a gaping bra, a loose bun, a dieter's armpit. Mrs. Skelton justifies it by saying she'll someday use the scarves to perform a heroic deed, like maybe lassoing a prize-winning pig from quicksand and giving up bacon. Mrs. Skelton goes to confessional booths and tapes tape recorders under the benches. Mrs. Skelton figures it's not a sin to listen to the sins of others if the sins of others are worse than hers. The name of Mrs. Skelton's lipstick is steamed lobster. It's a wanton cerise that rings her saccharine soda cans, her mint green toothbrush, the base of Mr. Skelton's penis. Burning bush, burning bright, tigress, tigress in the night. Mrs. Skelton never cooks. 
but still a heat rises within her every night at dinner. While her silent family eats, she's pulling scarves out of thin air, one after another, like, pra like phrases of praise. You did good, we like it. You did good, we like it. The silks gather at her feet like colorful confessions. If she wanted, Mrs. Skelton could take the scarves and tie them all together and escape out a window, manicured and validated. She could make a fashionable noose and hang herself from a willow, a paper birch. Or she could take them one by one and poke them into her mouth through her wanton cerise lips like a reverse magic trick and amaze everyone. Ta-da, presto, abracadabra. So the second story, no title. Sarah's sternum was a tuning fork and the death had been a strike to her breastbone. Beneath her flat face and ordinary dress was the eternal hum of terror. She hid it alongside a thin faith in a storybook god, animals two by two, a loaf made plural. Dinner parties only underscore these facts. What do I wear? Sarah asked Petra. What she meant was, press yourself against me until I fight for air. Whatever you think, Petra said. Petra was a lawyer for people who couldn't afford lawyers. Her work was kind, but she was less than. She possessed a commanding vacancy that filled Sarah with despair and lust. The people at the party would be Petra's, people with meaningful jobs who remained unmoved by work or meaning. Sarah had met them. They smelled of water, air, cold things no one could live without. Last time, they'd lounged about a solemn kitchen. On display were pomegranates split open like transplant organs. French pickles the sizes of baby's thumbs, sheets of transparent ham alongside the remains of a hand-fed sow. No one had eaten a pig. Before the party ended, it was tipped into a trash bag and curved. Sarah saw doctors. They looked at her as if she spoke a lesser language. They pinched the bridges of their noses. They recommended Zoloft, vinegar tea, weightlifting, but mostly the pills. There's a script for that, they'd say. But Sarah didn't want a script unless it told her the words her mouth should make. Wallace Willis, the empath, had come closest to curing Sarah. His eyes were the color of blue ice, the pretend kind in the penguin part of zoos. Tell me your original fear, he said. Sarah remembered being an infant, her father shelving books from tallest to shortest, her mother sleeping, one arm dangling as if shot. Baby powder, she said. It was a reminder everything was a cover-up. Well, now it's the death, Wallace Willis said, the details rather. This was true. The death had settled in Sarah like an anchor. But the car, the limbs, people kept bringing up the details, stirring the sand. I heard they found that over there, this over here. People juggled their remarks like hot potatoes, then tossed them at Sarah. Catch, think fast. Sarah wore a navy suit to the party. When she and Petra arrived, a woman named Jonas met them with two glasses of white liqueur. There were mint leaves floating on top. Jonas had on a gold camisole that clung to her nipples. Within each armpit glowed a suggestion of blonde hair. She showed her big teeth but didn't smile. You made it, she observed. In the kitchen, people stood with loose arms crossed. They said things like, when did that, when did that become a thing? At once, Sarah knew only love would cure her, relentless, unbidden love that carried her until she could carry herself. It was a loan she could not qualify for. Ashamed, Sarah swallowed her drink. The mint leaf stuck to the roof of her mouth. She could not remove it with her tongue. We were talking about the boy, a woman named Fells said. He climbs the Norway spruce, a woman named Regan said, up front. Sarah considered a row of tiny boiled eggs on the countertop. Pigeon, Fells said. He was just adopted. Regan yawned. Is he white or black or brown? All three, Fells said. That was the end of that. Regan asked about Fells's brass business. She sold antique candlesticks and the proceeds went to manatees. They have no predators, said Fells. The boats slice them because they aren't programmed for fear. Sarah went into the bathroom to remove the mint leaf. She looked for pills as an explanation, but there were no pills. There wasn't even soap, just a dish of oil that Sarah rubbed between her palms but could not rinse off. When she came out, she heard one of the women say, it is what it is. At camp as a girl, 
Sarah won a badge for asking the most questions about God. She kept it tucked in the bed springs of the bunk above her. It was the first thing she saw when the bugle blew at dawn and the last thing she saw when the bugle blew at dusk. All summer long, her mother sent her clementines and crosswords. She rode a red horse named Jam Cake. During canoeing, she let the life jacket bunch up under her chin so she could smell the mildew. The staff wore plastic gloves at supper time. They reached into giant tins and brought out oily handfuls of potato chips. Sarah's shins were spotted with green bruises. Her fingertips smelled forever of pine sap. At night, when the other girls slept, Sarah placed the palm, placed her palm over the smooth mound between her legs until she saw the face of God. She had no need for love then. At the dinner party sat 10 white plates and 10 short glasses filled with something the color of fog. Everyone stood behind their chairs and regarded the platter in the center. It held a gleaming pink slab that Sarah thought might be tuna without skin or watermelon without rind. When she looked up, she saw him out the window, the boy up the tree, on a limb, afraid. There he is, Sarah gasped, pointing, in the spruce. The other nine stared at her blankly before they turned slowly to look. She says something, Fells shrugged. The mother does. At the base of the tree was a woman. Her arms went out and up. Her mouth said words Sarah needed to hear. Were they, I love you? Were they, I'll leave you? The other guests turned back to the table. People think they can't hear, Fell said, but they can. They hear the boats perfectly fine, but they don't get out of the way. Sarah strained forward. The mother's mouth moved. Jonas motioned to the reason they were all there. Shall we? And the third story in threesome. The man was at the speed dating event, dressed in pajama pants, gas station flip-flops, and a stretched out Mount Rushmore t-shirt. Thomas Jefferson's face had been replaced with Lisa Simpson. The man's name tag said heliotrope, but his real name was Travis. My friend Alicia dragged me here to get laid, Travis told the man from across, across from him. His name tag said Bert. No pressure, Bert. Bert wore a three-piece suit and he was sweating buckets. I haven't sweat like this since the National Spelling Bee, Bert said, glancing at Lisa Simpson, then up at the ceiling. Heliotrope. A hairy plant of the Barrage family known for aromatic flowers. A mirroring device used in surveying. Magenta, the color, also known as fuchsia. F-U-C-H-S-I-A, fuchsia, a bloodstone. Heliotrope wasn't listening. He pulled a gray wad of gum from his mouth and stuck it to his index card of questions. Chopsticks or fork, window or aisle, top or bottom. Bert patted a handkerchief over his forehead. Cha-cha-cha, he stammered, chopsticks. Heliotrope reached across the folding table and took Bert's hand. Calm down, he said. It's almost over. Okay, Bert said. Okay. Conveniently, the speed dating event was in the lobby of a hotel. When the timer dinged, Heliotrope and Bert went upstairs. They watched the Simpsons until Bert had had enough from the minibar to get an erection. Heliotrope took off his pajama pants, but kept on his tee. Bert folded his suit and stalled for time until time ran out a second time. He looked at Heliotrope. He looked out the window. In his mind, someone played chopsticks. Heliotrope walked down an aisle. He carried, he carried heliotropes. Bert fed him groom's cake from a fork. They could drive off into the sunset, top down. They could honeymoon at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Okay, Bert said. Okay, Bert spelled. So those are just some little weird snapshots. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, first of all, Thank you. Secondly, um, you know, it never gets old. The the the, the distinct pleasure of hearing uh, a writer read their own work. Um, you know, there's something so intimate about reading the work if you know someone. Yeah. Um, but but hearing someone is just always a special treat. So I appreciate you doing that. You. And I think that is as as well as any of the stories um, gets at what I've kind of hopefully you know articulated, which is. The one of the best compliments I can give you is when I read your stuff, hear you read your stuff in the best possible way, 
I'm not able to easily say, you know, that really is in the vein of, or that reminds me of, and you've, you've carved out a very unique style. And, and maybe one of the reasons I respond so positively to your work is just speaking for myself uh, as a writer, as a reader, as a critic, there's nothing that I, that I loathe more than when you just can tell right away that someone is desperately trying to be X, like this is popular now. So I'm invoking this oh, or yeah. I yeah. want this to be accessible. So I'm doing this. And this is the opposite of that. So I certainly won't presume what your motivations are, but I just think it's clear to me that you are one of the rare artists, artistic types that is more obsessed with following your own path. But again, and I use this word earlier, but but not in a self-indulgent, because that can be off-putting, right? If someone's so unique and they're like, you have to dive deep to understand my recesses of my mind. No, 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 no. This is more you're trusting your own process and and realizing, you know, your own kind of magical brain is conjuring up these things. So again, there's this exchange that occurs between the reader and writer. Well, thanks. And I, you know, I think one of the things that I keep when I was writing these stories, and that's kind of this goes back to how I decided to put them under the umbrella of love stories, was I was like, wow, these all these stories are it's almost like each story was about one person grappling with an emotion. And I was like, okay, I mean, I'm getting a lot of detail and visuals in there along in, in the process, but it's, it was almost like, can you write a story that's just about someone trying to manage an emotional response? Because that's what we are doing most of, of our life is a managing emotional response, whether it's a positive or negative one, even a neutral one where we're checked out or whatever. But I kept seeing that happen. And, and I, you know, some of the longer stories have a real specific plot, but in these shorter flash ones, I can't, I, I got really into reading flash fiction while I was also writing this um, collection. So they're probably, there's, a, there's another story called Nine Dreams About Marriage. And it's basically nine, ideas strung together um and they it i would say most of them are about a character trying to process something yeah and can that be a story and that was what i kept pushing myself to do i was like make a story out of someone trying to process an emotional a challenging emotional state so, so yeah, the, the, the plot are... the plot was secondary to these yeah. to these to a certain degree. Whereas in Big Bad, it was more of like, oh, I have an idea for a plot. This was more like I have an emotion that I want to see if I can untangle. That that makes sense. It <laughs> makes total sense. And again, I think that that I think that that underscores um, you know this notion of what are the stakes. And and again, I I am a personally I'm a big fan of there no one needs to follow any rules you know go with go with what works but you're you're at once really abandoning the the guidelines but also respecting i think it i think that speaks to the intelligence and and your own kind of you know acumen as a reader you're bringing in all of this history and tradition but you're playing fast and loose and so that's where that the stakes live in what was the point? Like, is that person yeah. living or dying? And it's like, we're all living and dying every moment of every day. And and how do we artfully, you know, put that into a creative situation where it illuminates? Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's, I, I read some stuff also. I was reading, so I, I love Joy Williams. Joy Williams will write a, a great classic short story that's, you know, pretty, pretty traditional in terms of like the arc, beginning, middle, end, um, you know, climax and resolution. But she also wrote um, 99 stories about God, which were just these little like humorous, twisted little snippets. And then Diane Williams, another uh, author, writes just these bizarre stories where you're going, okay, like, I don't even know what's happening here. But I was like, I, but I know I like it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I thought, well, let's let's play with words, let's play with emotion. And I don't do that throughout the book, but in the right. shorter pieces, I really am. I, I got experimental. 
and then I and then I had to really give myself a break and also the reader a break by writing something that was more normal. <laughs> normal. <laughs> normal. <laughs> you know, just just your average, you know, I don't know. Yeah. No, nothing's normal in there, but Right. But a little more terra firma. Um right. Well, you know, Whitney, I'd be remiss and I'm I'm certain I didn't rewatch our our first conversation, I guess intentionally, so I didn't want to purloin previous uh, topics, but I'm sure we talked about this a few years ago, but man, you are one of the funniest writers that I've read. <laughs> and I just want to say, A, I want to, I want to point that out. Um, it, again, in my, you know, considerable experience, uh, my humble opinion, there's nothing wrong with humor in literary fiction. Um, it's rare, not because there's no place for it, but because I think so few people can do it well. Um, which begs the question, right? Can unfunny people write humor? Is or is it natural? Uh, is it inevitable that that funny writers are witty? And how important is humor to your life? I think I know the answer, but just talk a little bit about. Funny. Well, humor is. So I started out. I have the very first short story I ever wrote in first grade, <laughs> and it's about it's about a white Persian kitten that um that finds itself in the middle of a shark attack at, at the beach and it's like just i remember bringing it home and my family was like like what what's wrong with you <laughs> what and I, and I had illustrated it and there was blood and there was a kitten and it was and and i was like in my mind i was like this is this is high comedy like it wasn't horror like it wasn't yeah. you know and so i so clearly I've been dealing with twisted humor from the beginning and also just this love of juxtaposition. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was the title of the story was snowball goes to the beach and, and, <laughs> and snowball and snowball did not come home from the beach. So, um, you know, com so for me, humor has always just been my, my family, my father taped Saturday night live every Saturday night, we started out with a Betamax and he brought it home. This was in 1970, whatever. Yep. And he put it on like the den bookshelf. And he said, this is a Betamax and you can tape record TV shows. And I was, I mean, I was tiny and I was like, what? And so he taped Saturday night live that night. And then the next morning on Sunday morning, we got up before church and watched Saturday Night Live. And it was like, it was magic. And so my entire childhood, so the Betamax was retired. We ended up getting a you know, normal VCR. Yeah. But my dad was a civil engineer and he taped Saturday Night Live every Saturday, would take it out. And in his, in his engineering writing, he would write the musical guest and the host and the date. Amazing. And his, his, our entire like den bookshelf had him lined up. People would come to my house and they were like, we can watch any Saturday night live. I said, any. And so I was just raised on that. I was raised that, that this is, this was like, it was like a shrine. Yeah. So humor has just always been there for me. And humor has been the, my go-to in hard times. Mm-hmm. And it's, and not in a way to like deny the pain, but in a way to process it. Cause I'm okay with pain. Yeah, I, I like to write about pain. I like to admit it's there. I like to walk outside and go, this is a gorgeous day. This is happening across the ocean. This is happening down the street. I'm yeah. okay with pain, but pain cannot be managed on its own. You've got to have some sort of like medicine there to like, and for me, it's always been humor. So that's a very long way to answer your question. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. And, and, and I, it, it made me think while you were talking that, you know, I think that that, that gets to why the better uh, stand up comedians across generations are so revered. I mean, yes, they give us joy and humor and you can't put right. a price tag on that, but, but the court jester element of, we can go back to Shakespeare, not to mention yeah. the Greeks, like 
humor is not just to mask the pain. I think, again, I, what I keep coming back to is this notion of generosity. Um, yeah. Again, I think artistically speaking, there is a self-indulgence in wallowing in the pain or there's a, it's too literal. It's not artistic enough to just say, yeah, I'm, I'm painting what I see. It's like that, I guess is art, but that's a transcription, but, but to find right. humor, there's a deep abiding love of this crazy process of living. Um, and again, I think that comes through in your work where it's not humor for humor's sake. I, I was careful to use the word and I'll repeat it. Wit. I think wit yeah. comes like, and your name is wit. <laughs> I think the wit is, is the genesis of the humor. And then it's through that lens of getting the joke, seeing the joke, wanting to share that to at once right. lessen the pain and heighten the pathos and, and all of that. Yeah. Well, and you think about like, there's something beautiful about humor. Like humor is this bridge between like beauty and like tragedy. Like if you just wrote a, I don't know, there, there has to be something in there that's, that's between those two worlds. And I don't know, there's something really gracious about humor. It's, it allows you to really, to, to go back and forth between the two worlds. Yeah. Without, without whiplash, you know, it's without whiplash. So I just, it, it naturally shows up in my work. I'm one of those people when I'm driving down the street, like I see something and I see it. I see a lot of things as funny Yeah. or, yeah. or ironic. You yes. Know? Yes. I, and being in tune to that, you know, yeah. again, I, I, I think, so much of the writing that that we see or so much of the art really thinking about movies and, and everything is either so literal or so earnest um again i think that that's telegraphing um it, it's not showing us ourselves whenever i think about poetry and I, I think i had an early writing teacher that put it so simply this just stayed with me is like poetry is saying what everyone knows but just saying it differently and it's like that's a good that's a good enough yeah fifth grade understanding of what metaphor and simile do, but right. it is this notion of well, anyone can do it. What makes it art? And it, it's having that unique take that, that illuminates something. Yeah. I, I think, I think humor, if you're going to find it, in my opinion, you find it most in short stories. I think um, it's, yeah. You know, if you really, if you really mine the masters, there's, there's a appreciate, there's an, at least an appreciation, a nod for absurdity. And, you know, I, I think we have to acknowledge the fact that life is absurd. And I, I leaned into absurdity a little bit more in this, in this collection. As, as befits the times we live in. Right. You know, thinking of humor just in the 20th century, I mean, what connects writers who wrote about such dark stuff as Kafka, Flannery O'Connor, and George Saunders, just to yeah. just to name three off the top of my head. Yeah, very, perfect. very different writers, right? I mean, right. very different sensibilities, but there's that humor in all of those. I mean, Flannery O'Connor, I think people would maybe forget, like, she's hilarious, but she also oh. is, you know, has written some of the most harrowing um, descriptions yeah. of, of human interaction. But it is right. that wit and humor that, again, I think I think delineates the love of humanity, which which shines right. through. Um, maybe okay. that's also what I f personally find lacking with so much art I engage with. This aridness of it's technically fine, but right, right. is there any there there? Um, right. Before I let you go, again, I feel it's incumbent upon me, especially the week of your book. By, which, by the way, thank you again for finding oh. time. You oh, got a God. little bit on your plate right yeah. now, but, um, you know, feel free to not engage with this, this kind of silly question, but I think you'll, maybe you'll agree. It's, it's inevitable that it has to be asked, but we are as writers, right. Navigating a time where it seems anyway, despite what we talked about with short stories, having a moment, yay, poetry, yeah. having a moment, but every writer now more than when we first met over 10 years ago, it's like, it's, in, we have to be a brand. You have to be branding yourself. You have to be active. You have to be engaged. Oh, you have to be constantly selling. And, and there's all these pressures. And yeah. I, I guess I think it always comes down to balance, right? That the writers I know that are most adjusted have ambition. 
they get the work done, which is no, that's the hugest part of it. That's the hardest but, part. But also aren't aloof, right? I, I do yeah. think there's a kind of a, I don't engage and I'm not on social media, but how, how are you finding the balance of, you, we have to put our shingles up, we have to try to yeah. put ourselves out there, but we also have to step away from the, the craziness and go, I don't want to live online. And is right. it worth it if I have to be a brand and be someone that I'm not when I'm writing? I think you do it very well, but I'm curious where well, you're I think that's at. a big, I think that's, that's great that you bring that up because I think it's a big challenge. I think it's a big challenge to everyone. I think even people that aren't in the art world or aren't selling a product, even just regular people on social media feel like, okay, well, I have to create a persona or I have to create some sort of, you know, like you said, a brand, you know, and, you know, everything has to fall under that. And so I can never post anything serious or I can never post anything funny or I can never post anything ugly or so there's this social media is so fascinating to me. I I, I don't think it's all bad. I don't think it's all good, but it, 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 you, I think you have to be very aware of how you're personally using it. Not so much. So how it's how other people see, see you, but how you start to see yourself, you know, and I think that you can get caught up in, well, I'm a writer and I have to present everything I write this way or, and it's tough because I want to share my work. There's a little bit of an obligation to share it um, in, in the marketing world. I, I'm required to share things that other people share and repost and do these things. Yeah. And it, it, it can be endless. And it can also be very um, tempting to just kind of cloak everything to make it look alike. And then all of a sudden you're like, is this really what I want my work to be seen as or me to be seen as? So I, I think it's important to step away from it occasionally and just go, you know, okay, how, how can I use this in a good way and in an authentic way? And being authentic in what, in what sort of art you're creating and then being authentic in how you're marketing that art are just, I think you have to constantly revisit it. Because if you're up there just mindlessly doing it, you will create some sort of facade or mask or version of yourself. I don't want to put a version of my work out there or a version of myself out there. And it is, it's a, it's a modern dilemma. It is. It is. Well, first of all, that was a mic drop moment. I think that was very, <laughs> um, very powerfully and succinctly stated, but I think you, I, I, I do agree. Um, and I think you touch on the key word, which is authenticity. And I think, yeah. Again, what I cherish about your whole sensibility is authenticity as a person and authenticity as an artist. And it's like easily said, yeah. easily yeah. invoked, very challenging. And again, I think where you end up is you're constantly artfully navigating this balance between being very true to your own vision, but making it accessible enough, um, mm -hmm. putting yourself out there, entering contests, you know, being part of the the game or part of the joy, part of the ride. Right. But, but also preserving some space. Um, I think it's, a, I, I appreciate your, your humility. Uh, I think you do it very well, but I, I'm glad that you concede as I happily concede. It, it takes a lot of work because I think when we're not writing, we feel guilty because we're not productive. If we're not hustling in the 21st century, you don't want it enough. And it's like, right. You know, you do, I, I've, I have not found an answer that doesn't revolve around balance. Even if that is a cliche, there's a yeah. reason it's a cliche. I think balance is the key. Um, it really is. Because I know some, I know a lot of artists and writers who have a real aversion to self-promotion and I get it. And then I know some people that just stay caught up in the promotional side of it and the branding side and, you know, then, then, okay, then you're not taking any alone time and completely unplugging to create the art. So it's this weird balance. And I, I have always said, I think every MFA program would, it would behoove them to have a very specific class or several classes on, this is how you market yourself. Yeah. Because that it's, it's, it's hard for creative people to do that. And I think that it wouldn't hurt to show people how to do that 
exposure is hard. Exposure is hard when you get something published and people read it and they go, oh, is that actually not fiction? Is that about you? <laughs> there's that. Sure. Um, and then there's the exposure of advertising. But, yeah. but if you don't expose yourself, your work's not going to be great and your work's not going to be seen. So it's just, you might as well just be sitting in the closet with a spiral notebook and, you know, writing a book, yes. snowball goes to the beach. Right. Well, and I think, and I think, you know, th that's yet another important point. I think it's disingenuous when any artist either pretends or claims like, I just write for myself and that's it. It's like, well then keep in a yeah. journal. Like there, there is something, right. there is something that you put, you, you do, give up that control um and again speaking of balance um you know when we write a short story or a poem or whatever there is that that initial and very important sense of achievement that yes. i think it's like an itch being scratched and then the stuff that happens after that is kind of gravy like are people going to engage with us are people going to like it i think a lot of that doesn't matter if if the artist isn't satisfied and no matter how precious that sounds i believe that very deeply like if you're ultimately pleased on some level like you know you've done the best you can and you can walk away and move on to the next thing that's progress um and it isn't as important what other people think but the writers that i know that seem the most unhappy or the artists are exactly what you talked about that that balance is askew and they're too much in the promotional world or they they care too much um about it's accolades. hard to put yourself out there and you you know there are times when i go oh god i feel so like I've had I've had to post four things this week and and one of them was a really weird story and there, there there are weeks where I go this week was too much like I feel too too raw like too yeah. much attention or the story was really weird and people are grappling with it and then there but you know that's just part of it and it's okay at the end of the day no one is really thinking about you as much as you think they're thinking about you you know <laughs> you know <laughs> I have to remind myself of that. I'm like, just get your work out there and do the best you can in the promotional part of it. And sometimes it'll feel weird and icky. And then other times it'll feel great because you, you know, it feels like you're hitting the right balance of everything, but yeah, it's, 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 I think it's the hardest part of being an artist. I would say the hardest part's writing, but I think the hardest part is really being seen and getting comfortable with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it never hurts when you <laughs> write books that people want to read. So uh, Whitney, it's always, I mean, it's just a joy speaking to you. I'm positive everyone that's checking this out is is picking up what I'm putting down. Like, isn't this a great person to to hear from? Um, Ricky and other love stories. I mean, what more, what more can I do here other than to say, go seek it out, seek out big bad, check out, is it WhitneyCollins.com? Let me make sure yeah. I'm, yeah. Yep. Find out more, see links to her work um, and, and join me in congratulating and celebrating. And this is the week. This is it. It's I'm, out in the world. And, um, you know, Whitney, it's a, it's a big deal, right? We talked a lot about craft. Um, I, I adore getting your perspective, but let's take a, just a moment and celebrate. Like getting a book into the world is something a lot of people that are very talented never have a chance to do. So you did it. Uh, you did it well, and I wish you all the best. I'm Thank positive you, this is going to continue to find its audience, and I'm certainly happy to get on my modest rooftop and and shout Thank it you. out. Um, it, it's just a tremendous uh, blessing to know you and talk to you. So totally appreciate you. you coming and chatting today. Well, I sure appreciate it, and I'm loving your book. I've got it right here. I'm going to hold it up. I'm wow. loving this. Talk about talk about timely like. Just it's just wonderful. The stories are so important. Well, thank you for that. And I wasn't gonna say anything because it, it it doesn't seem appropriate, but I, I now will say Whitney was kind enough to give a very generous blurb for that book. And um, I can tell you folks, any you always want to make your friends and family proud, obviously. But when you have someone that you admire uh give you some love, it really goes deep and is meaningful. Wow. So Thank you, in addition to everything else, for being a great literary citizen, um, wow. being very generous and paying it forward. Yet another reason to love you and, and wish you oh. all the success. Thank you. Well, I can't thank you enough for having me on. And um, let's see it. Let's see what Ricky does. Yes. I call, I call back. Ricky, 
the little brother, the little brother of Big Bad. So well, to be continued, both in terms <laughs> of your career, um, our conversation. You're welcome back anytime, and you, you know I'm going to be hunting you down. So this this will not be uh, the last time. Oops. All right, that we chat. So folks, thanks for tuning in to some things considered. Um, find out more, including how to be a guest at SeanMurphy.net. And reminder, we're obsessed with story and celebrating creativity. We're here to advocate for the arts by any means necessary. Drop us a line, get involved, and support our creatives who are the lifeblood of our culture. Be well. Thanks for tuning in to Some Things Considered. Find out more, including how to be a guest at seanmurphy.net. Reminder, we are obsessed with story and celebrating creativity. Also, we're here to advocate for the arts by any means necessary. Drop us a line, get involved, and support our creatives who are the lifeblood of our culture. I'm Sean Murphy. See you on the next episode of Some Things Considered.